All Quiet on the Western Front, Chapter 2. It is strange to think that at home in the drawer of my writing table, there lies the beginning of a play called Saul and a bundle of poems. Many an evening I have worked over them. We all did something of the kind. But that has become so unreal to me, I cannot comprehend it anymore. Our early life is cut off from the moment we came here, and that without our lifting a hand. We often try to look back on it and to find an explanation, but never quite succeed. For us young men of 20, everything is extraordinarily vague. For Krop, Mueller, Lear, and for me, for all of us whom Cantoric calls the Iron Youth. All the older men are linked up with their previous life. They have wives, children, occupations, and interests. They have a background which is so strong that the war cannot obliterate it. We young men of 20, however, have only our parents and some, perhaps, a girl. That is not much, for at our age, the influence of parents is at its weakest, and girls have not yet got a hold over us. Besides this, there was little else. Some enthusiasm, a few hobbies in our school. Beyond this, our life did not extend, and of this, nothing remains. Kentoric would say that we stood on the threshold of life, and so it would seem. We had as yet taken no root. The war swept us away. For others, the older men, it is but an interruption. They are able to think beyond it. We, however, have been gripped by it and do not know what the end may be. We know only that in some strange and melancholy way we have become a wasteland. All the same, we are not often sad. Though Mueller would be delighted to have Kemrick's boots, he is really quite as sympathetic as another who could not bear to think of such a thing for grief. He merely sees things clearly. Were Kemrick able to make any use of the boots, then Mueller would rather go barefoot over barbed wire than scheme how to get a hold of them. But as it is, the boots are quite inappropriate to Kemrick's circumstances, whereas Mueller can make good use of them. Kemrick will die. It is immaterial who gets them. Why then should Mueller not succeed to them? He has more right than the hospital orderly. When Kemrick is dead, it will be too late. Therefore, Mueller is already on the watch. We have lost all sense of other considerations because they're artificial. Only the facts are real and important to us, and good boots are scarce. Once it was different. When we went to the district commandant to enlist, we were a class of 20 young men, many of whom proudly shaved for the first time before going to the barracks. We had no definite plans for our future. Our thoughts of a career and occupation were as yet of too unpractical a character to furnish any scheme of life. We were still crammed full of vague ideas which gave to life, and to the war also an ideal and almost romantic character. We were trained in the army for 10 weeks and in this time more profoundly influenced than by 10 years at school. We learned that a bright button is weightier than four volumes of Schopenhauer. At first astonished, then embittered, and finally indifferent, we recognized that what matters is not the mind, but the boot brush, not intelligence, but the system, not freedom, but drill. We became soldiers with eagerness and enthusiasm, but they have done everything to knock that out of us. After three weeks, it was no longer incomprehensible to us that a braided postman should have more authority over us than had formerly our parents, our teachers, and the whole gamut of culture from Plato to Getty. With our young, awakened eyes, we saw that the classical conception of the fatherland held by our teachers resolved itself here into a renunciation of personality such as one would not ask of the meanest servants. Salutes springing to attention, parade marches, presenting arms, right wheel, left wheel, clicking the heels, insults, and a thousand pedophaging details. We had fancied our task would be different, only to find we were to be trained for heroism as though we were circus ponies. But we soon accustomed ourselves to it. We learned, in fact, that some of these things were necessary, but the rest merely show. Soldiers have a fine nose for such distinctions. By threes and fours, our class was scattered over the platoons amongst Frisian fishermen, peasants, and laborers with whom we soon made friends. Krop, Mueller, Kemrick, and I went to number nine platoon under Corporal Himmelstas. He had the reputation of being the strictest disciplinarian in the camp and was proud of it. He was a small, undersized fellow with a foxy waxed mustache who had seen 12 years service and was in civil life a postman. 
He had a special dislike for Crop, Chad, and Westus and me because he sensed a quiet defiance. I have remade his bed 14 times in one morning. Each time he had some fault to find and pulled it to pieces. I have kneaded a pair of prehistoric boots that were as hard as iron for 20 hours, with intervals, of course, until they became as soft as butter and not even Himmelstoss could find anything more to do with them. Under his orders, I have scrubbed out the corporal's mess with a toothbrush. Crop and I were given the job of clearing the barrack square of snow with a hand broom and a dustpan, and we would have gone on till we were frozen had not a lieutenant accidentally appeared who sent us off and hauled Himmelstoss over the coals. But the only result of this was to make Himmelstoss hate us more. For six weeks consecutively, I did guard every Sunday and was hut orderly for the same length of time. With full pack and rifle, I've had to practice on a wet, soft, newly plowed field, the prepare to advance, advance, and the lie down until I was one lump of mud and finally collapsed. Four hours later, I had to report to Himmelstoss with my clothes scrubbed clean, my hands chafed and bleeding. Together with Krop, Westus, and Chiaden, I have stood at attention in a hard frost without gloves for a quarter of an hour at a stretch, while Himmelstoss watched for the slightest movement of our bare fingers. On the steel barrel of the rifle. I have run eight times from the top floor of the barracks down to the courtyard in my shirt at two o'clock in the morning because my drawers projected three inches beyond the edge of the stool on which one had to stack all one's things. Alongside me ran cor the Corporal Himmelstoss and trod on my bare toes. At bayonet practice, I had constantly to fight with Himmelstoss, I with a heavy iron weapon, whilst he had a handy wooden one with which he easily struck my arms till they were black and blue. Once, indeed, I became so infuriated that I ran at him blindly and gave him a mighty jab in the stomach and knocked him down. When he reported me, the company commander laughed at him and told him he ought to keep his eyes open. He understood Himmelstoss and apparently was not displeased at his discomfiture. I became a past master on the parallel bars and excelled at physical jerks. We have trembled at the mere sound of his voice but this runaway post horse never got the better of us. One Sunday, as Crop and I were lugging a latrine bucket on a pole across the barrack yard, Himmelstoss came by, all polished up and spry for going out. He planted himself in front of us and asked how we liked the job. In spite of ourselves, we tripped and emptied the bucket over his legs. He raved, but the limit had been reached. That means clink, he yelled, but Crop had had enough. There'll be an inquiry first, he said, and then we'll unload. Mind how you speak to a non-commissioned officer, bawled Hemelstoss. Have you lost your senses? You wait till you're spoken to. What will you do anyway? Show you, Corporal, said Crop, his thumbs in line with the seams of his trousers. Hemelstoss saw that we meant it, and he went off without saying a word. But before he disappeared, he growled, you'll drink this. But that was the end of his authority. He tried it on once more in the plowed field with his prepare to advance, advance, and lie down. We obeyed each order, since an order is an order and has to be obeyed, but we did it so slowly that Himmelstoss became desperate. Carefully we went down on our knees, then on our hands, and so on. In the meantime, quite infuriated, he had given another command. But before we had even begun to sweat, he was hoarse. After that, he left us in peace. He did indeed always refer to us as swine, but there was nevertheless a certain respect in his tone. There were many other staff corporals, the majority of whom were more decent, but above all of each of them wanted to keep his, job, his good job there as long as possible, and this could do only by being strict with the recruits. So we were put through every conceivable refinement of parade ground soldiering till we often howled with rage. Many of us became ill through it. Wolf actually died of inflammation of the lung. But we would have felt ridiculous had we hauled down our colors. We became hard, suspicious, pitiless, vicious, tough, and that was good, for these attributes were just what we lacked. Had we gone into the trenches without this period of training, most of us would certainly have gone mad. Only thus were we prepared for what awaited us. 
We did not break down, but adapted ourselves. Our 20 years, which made many other things so grievous, helped us in this. But by far the most important result was that it awakened in us a strong practical sense of esprit de corps, which in the field developed into the finest thing that arose out of the war, comradeship. I sit by Kimmerich's bed. He is sinking steadily. Around us is a great commotion. A hospital tram has arrived and the wounded fit to be moved are being selected. The doctor passes by Kimmerich's bed without once looking at him. Next time, Franz, I say. He raises himself on the pillow with his elbows. They've amputated my leg. He knows it too, then. I nod and answer. You must be thankful you've come off with that. He is silent. I resume. It might have been both legs, Franz. Wegler had lost his right arm. That's much worse. Besides, you'll be going home. He looks at me. Do you think so? Of course. Do you think so? He repeats. Sure, Franz, once you've gotten over the operation. He beckons me to bend down. I stoop over Ben and he whispers. I don't think so. Don't talk rubbish, Franz. In a couple of days, you'll see for yourself. What is it anyway, an amputated leg? Here they patch up far worse things than that. He lifts one hand. Look here, though, these fingers. That's the result of the operation. Just eat decently and you'll soon be well again. Do they look after you properly? He points to a dish that is still half full. I get excited. Franz, you must eat. Eating is the main thing. That looks good, too. He turns away. After a pause, he says slowly, I wanted to become a head forester once. So you may still, I assure him. There are splendid artificial limbs now. You'd hardly know there was anything missing. They are fixed onto the muscles. You can move the fingers and work and even write with an artificial hand. And besides, they will always be making new improvements. For a while, he lies still. Then he says, you can take my lace-up boots with you for Mueller. I nod and wonder what to say to encourage him. His lips have fallen away. His mouth has become larger. His teeth stick out and look as though they were made of chalk. The flesh melts, the forehead bulges more prominently, the cheekbones protrude. The skeleton is working itself through. The eyes are already sunken in. In a couple of hours, it will be over. He is not the first that I have seen thus, but we grew up together, and that always makes it a bit different. I have copied his essays. At school, he used to wear a brown coat with a belt and a shiny sleeves. He was the only one of us, too, who could do the giant's turn on the horizontal bar. His hair flew in his face like silk when he did it. Cantoric was proud of him, but he couldn't stand cigarettes. His skin was very white. He had something of the girl about him. I glance at my boots. They're big and clumsy. The breeches are tucked into them, and standing up, one looks well built and powerful in these great drain pipes. When we go bathing and strip, suddenly we have slender legs again and slight shoulders. We're no longer soldiers, but little more than boys. No one would believe that we could carry packs. It is a strange moment when we stand naked, then we become civilians and almost feel ourselves to be so. When bathing, Franz Kemrich looks as slight and frail as a child. There he lies now, but why? The whole world ought to pass by this bed and say, that is Franz Kemrich, 19 and a half years old. He doesn't want to die. Let him not die. My thoughts become confused. This atmosphere of carbolic and gangrene clogs the lungs. It is a thick gruel. It suffocates. It grows dark. Kemrick's face changes color. It lifts from the pillow and is so pale that it gleams. The mouth moves slightly. I draw near to him. He whispers, if you find my watch, send it home. I do not reply. It is no use anymore. No one can console him. I am wretched with helplessness. This forehead when it's hollow temples, this mouth that now seems all teeth, this sharp nose, and the fat, weeping woman at home whom I must write. If only the letter were sent off already. Hospital orderlies go to and fro with bottles and pails. One of them comes up, casts a glance at Kemrick, and goes away again. You can see he is waiting. Apparently he wants the bed. 
I bend over Franz and talk to him as though that could save him. Perhaps you will go to the convalescent home at Klosterberg, among the vias, Franz. Then you can look out from the window across the fields to the two trees on the horizon. It is the loveliest time of year now, when the corn ripens. At evening, the fields and the sunlight look like mother of pearl, and the lane of poplars by the Klosterbach, where we used to catch sticklebacks. You can build an aquarium again and keep fishing it, and you can go without asking anyone. You can even play the piano if you want to. I lean down over his face, which lies in the shadow. He still breathes lightly. His face is wet. He is crying. What a fine mess I have made of it with my foolish talk. But Franz, I put my arm round his shoulder and put my face against his. Will you sleep now? He does not answer. The tears run down his cheeks. I would like to wipe them away, but my handkerchief is too dirty. An hour passes. I sit tensely and watch his every movement in case he may perhaps say something. What if he were to open his mouth and cry out? But he only weeps, his head turned aside. He does not speak of his mother or his brothers and sisters. He says nothing. All that lies behind him, he is entirely alone now with his little life of 19 years and cries because it leaves him. This is the most disturbing and hardest parting that I've ever seen, although it was pretty bad to watch with Tejian, who called for his mother, a big bear of a fellow who, with wild eyes full of terror, held off the doctor from his bed with a dagger until he collapsed. Suddenly, Kemrick groans and begins to gurgle. I jump up, stumble outside, and demand, Where's the doctor? Where's the doctor? As I catch sight of the white apron, I seize hold of it. Come quick, Franz Kemrick is dying. He frees himself and asks an orderly standing by, which will that be? He says, bed 26, amputated thigh. He sniffs. How should I know anything about it? I've amputated five legs today. He shoves me away, says to the hospital orderly, you see to it, and hurries off to the operating room. I tremble with rage as I go along with the orderly. The man looks at me and says, one operation after another since five o'clock this morning. You know, today alone there have been 16 deaths. Yours is the 17th. There will probably be 20 altogether. I become faint. All at once I cannot do any more. I won't revile anymore. It is senseless. I could drop down and never rise up again. We are by Kemrick's bed. He is dead. The face is still wet from the tears. The eyes are half open and yellow like old horn buttons. The orderly pokes me in the ribs. Are you taking the things with you? I nod. He goes on. We must take him away at once. We want the bed. Outside, they're lying on the floor. I collect Kemrick's things and untie his identification disc. The orderly asks about the pay book. I say that it is probably in the orderly room and go. Behind me, they're already hauling Franz onto a waterproof sheet. Outside the door, I'm aware of the darkness and the wind as a deliverance. I breathe as deep as I can and feel the breeze in my face, warm and soft as never before. Thoughts of girls, of flowery meadows, of white clouds suddenly come into my head. My feet begin to move forward in my boots. I go quicker. I run. Soldiers pass by me. I hear their voices without understanding. The earth is streaming with forces which pour into me through the soles of my feet. The night crackles electrically. The front thunders like a concert of drums. My limbs move supply. I feel my joints strong. I breathe the air deeply. The night lives. I live. I feel a hunger greater than comes from the belly alone. Mueller stands in front of the hut waiting for me. I give him the boots. We go in and he tries them on. They fit well. He roots among the supplies and offers me a fine piece of savloy. With it goes hot tea and rum.